Good morning, everyone. Got all buttons pushed that I need to get pushed. Um, let's see. Today we're delving into, right, we're on this, this trek through the Lord's Prayer. And we're going through the, the various petitions, the various requests that Jesus taught us to pray. And I think the order of this one is weird, right? Lead us not into temptation. Last week we talked about forgiveness, and now don't let us get tempted. Wouldn't it make more sense to say, don't lead us into temptation, but if we mess up, then forgive us? That's not how Jesus ordered it. What's interesting is he said, you're already forgiven before you have to worry about the sin, right? It's already been paid for. Jesus paid the debt. The forgiveness comes first. That's what we're going to talk about. Let's uh, share the peace. If you're new, that just means kind of introduce yourself to folks around you, say good morning, and then we'll get started with our service. All right, we're going to kick things off with uh, number 748, 748. Please stand as we make our beginning in the name of our God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to Almighty God before the whole company of heaven and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed 
by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. Wherefore, I pray God Almighty to have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given to us his only Son to suffer and die for our salvation. It is for that reason I, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, do therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He who began this good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace be with you. Our intro, it begins, The Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. To you, O oh Lord, I call. My rock, be not deaf to me. Lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help. When I lift up my hands, toward your most holy sanctuary. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exalts, and with my song I give thanks to him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is the strength of his people, he is the saving refuge of his anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forevermore. Be with you. We pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have revealed your truth to all in the person of your Son and have bound yourself to what he accomplished on the cross. Give to us faith to trust in your mercy and confidence to walk in his way to eternal life. We pray all this through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for today is taken from Genesis chapter 39. 
Regardless of the circumstances of your life, you can hold fast to the promise of God that he is with you. Know that you can trust him. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Israelites, who had brought him down from there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended and did, did to succeed in his hands. Nope. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him, ov him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he was made, made him overseer of the house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in his house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day, when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he has left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, he lifted, I lifted my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant who you have brought among us came to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke of him, this is the way your servant treated me. His anger was kindled, and Joseph master, Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading for today is from Romans chapter 6. Paul lays out the core of the gospel message, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. What shall I say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who lived in sin still live in it? Do we not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized, baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we had been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a res resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we could no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we had not have died with Christ, we believe that we are also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you may also consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Excuse me. Please do stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. 
The Holy Gospel is according to St. John, the 18th chapter. <clears throat> it reads there, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the, the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it is commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And at once he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written, that the testimony of two men is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We're going to sing verses 1, 7, and 9. Verse 1, 7, and 9 of hymn 766. All the, all the kids, come on down. Come on down. 
Oh, I know there's more than two. I saw more than two. Oh, some of them maybe aren't so sure they want to come up here. So, what's this? Actually, it's a cell phone, right? Yeah. And what's really cool is you can actually watch. Oh, I had it, I had it queued up. Well, you can watch last week's service right here. I'll get there. Look at that. You can watch last week's service. That's us here last week. Isn't that cool? Here's one thing about this. What happens if I don't plug this in for a day or two? The battery goes dead. That's just it. It's out. Can't turn it on, right? You got to keep the battery charged. You know, that's actually what coming to church is all about, about getting our batteries recharged, right? All the stuff out in the world, and there's fun things like playing with friends or maybe watching your favorite TV show, and then there might be things like having to do chores and stuff like that, right? That may not be as much fun, but all that stuff keeps us so busy, and it can kind of get us worn down and then we come to church and church reminds us what's really important and what's really important is that Jesus paid for all our sins isn't that awesome when did he do that 2,000 years ago which means he paid for the times you mess up even before you messed up today in the message I've got for the for the adults that's what we're going to kind of talk about is God paid for the mess even before we messed up. While we were, the Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? So that's the most important thing to remember is that God's goodness comes even before you make a mistake. And church is about getting that recharge that keeps us going week to week to week. Sound like a good deal? Come on up here, get one of these, and then you guys can head on back. What would you like? There you go, okay. All right, thanks for coming up. Hopefully that won't go off during church. That was my fear. <laughs> but grace to you, I pray, and peace in Jesus' name. Amen. So continuing this, this trek through the Lord's Prayer. We're getting down near the end. We're in the sixth of seven requests. But in this sixth petition, Jesus says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation. And as I, I mentioned in the opening, I want you to notice the close connection there is between the sixth and the fifth petition from last week. The fifth petition deals with forgiveness. And then today, number six, deals with temptation. Isn't the order kind of interesting? I mean, wouldn't it make more sense for the petition about temptation to come first, and then, if and when we sin, we move on to the request about forgiveness. But that's not the way Jesus teaches us to pray it. He puts the Father's forgiveness first. Like we learned Last week, God's forgiveness always does come first before we get to the topic of temptation and how weak we are to stand against it, how often we fall into it, how foolish and naive we can be about just how dangerous sin really is. Before we get to the topic of temptation, we already know we're forgiven. I mean, you think about that, that really changes the way we treat the words lead us not into temptation. We're not asking God to keep us from falling into temptation so he doesn't have to go through the trouble of forgiving us again and again. He's already paid the price up front in advance and in full before the debt comes. That tells us this petition, this request, lead us not into temptation, is the prayer of a grateful faithful soul who wants to honor God by trying to avoid falling into temptation. 
Now we could say the, the opposite, right? Maybe we should say, well, since God is so good in forgiving all my sins first, even without my prayers, maybe I don't need to be so concerned about sin, about temptations that come my way. I mean, why should I bother to worry about these things? The more I sin, the more of God's grace I get. Just be comfortable with my sin so God's forgiveness and his grace may increase and abound. Why not? Because, well, you know, as I do, that would be an abuse of God's grace. It would be an abuse of his love. It would be an abuse of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us, which we will receive just minutes from now. It would be an abuse of your holy baptism. St. Paul actually answers that very question specifically. He says, what should we say then? Are we to continue in, gra in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life, a new kind of life, a life striving always to avoid what we know is inevitable. We know we're going to mess up. We know we're going to sin. Try as we might to dodge it. Lead us not into temptation is the prayer of a grateful soul who in thanksgiving to God for his grace is honoring our Lord's suffering and death on the cross, knowing it was for my sin that he was crucified, died, and was buried. The purpose of that tormentuous dark Friday was that he shed his blood to wipe your slate completely clean. How can we have anything but gratitude? And how else can we show it but to try to resist every temptation, praying God would help us to do it? So St. John talks about this, this woman we heard about in the Bible story, right? I, I'm sorry, in the, in the gospel lesson. The scribes and the Pharisees bring this woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in the midst of Jesus. And you wonder why they only brought one person. But they say, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery. The law says she should be condemned. What do you say? And of course they're doing this because they want to try to force him into a question where no matter what answer he gives, they can get him. And it says Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the sand. And then he said, let the one who is without sin throw the first stone. Then he wrote some more in the sand. And I always wondered what he wrote. But it says that the older ones first left and then the younger ones. And then Jesus stood up and said, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And he said, Then neither do I. Go and from now on sin no more. So here's the question. What did she do with that grace she was given? How did she live the rest of her life? And you know, the truth is, the Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know. For all we know, she went right back to her old ways. But hopefully, prayerfully, she was so thankful for Jesus' kindness that she repented. She turned from her old life and walked in that newness of life that Paul teaches us Jesus gives. That new life Jesus gave her. That would be the only really appropriate response, the honorable response, the faithful response. Hopefully, prayerfully, she prayed something like, Our Father in heaven, lead us not into temptation. Temptation's goal is to cause you to sin. It's sin that, that ultimately separates us from God and cuts us off from God. If you can avoid temptation, you stand a good chance of not sinning, right? If only that were true, or if it were that simple. In, in one of Martin Luther's commentaries, on this prayer, he said, we are beset before and behind temptation and cannot throw it off. There's no escaping it. Luther identifies the source of the temptation 
as the devil, the world, and our own sinful self, which really does cut off any means of escape because you can't escape the world, you can't escape yourself, and the truth is you can't escape the devil. He's coming for you like a roaring lion, and he's going to get you. That really means anything, absolutely anything, can become a temptation to sin. We, we kind of like to think temptation to sin is found only in the, the bad things, the evil things, the sinful things. If only it were that simple. If something as innocent as a pleasing to the eye piece of fruit can become temptation to turn us away from God, probably just about anything can. That's what makes our journey of faith through this life so dangerous, so precarious. We may think we've charted out the safe path to, path to follow. We may think ourselves experts in the, in the Word of God and His love. We might think we can identify those snares and traps along the way that would catch us. The truth is, we can never escape it. We can never escape the temptation that has completely surrounded us. In Jesus' high priestly prayer, it's called, it's this prayer he gives for you. He's not just praying for his disciples. He says he's praying for all those who would come. That includes us. It's in John 17. You might want to read it this week. Jesus says something interesting. To, he prays to the Father, I do not ask you to take them out of the world. Jesus doesn't say, if you follow me, if you're my disciple, then temptations will flee or the Father will take you away from them. In fact, he says really just the opposite to his disciples. He says temptation will continue surround, to surround you even though he claims us as his own. He says temptations are, are sure to come because we still live in this fallen, corrupt world. And so we are affected by it as much as we are supposed to be affecting it. You don't have to go looking real far for temptation, right? It's going to come and find you, and it will find you. It, it really does no good to think, if only I was a better Christian, then I'd be free of temptation. If only I was more faithful, then temptation wouldn't harass me. In fact, that very idea can become a temptation to sin. If I really believe, then I wouldn't struggle so much with the temptations that surround me. The risk there is, as sin continues to attack as it must and will, one might jump to the conclusion, well, maybe God doesn't love me. Or maybe I don't really believe. Maybe I'm not really a child of God. Maybe God really doesn't care about me. Well, that would mess up a whole lot of things the Bible tells us about like Peter, who is tempted to deny knowing Jesus while Jesus was on trial for Peter's sins? Or what about David being tempted by Bathsheba? What about Joseph, who is tempted by Potiphar's wife? What about Adam and Eve, the very pinnacle of God's perfect creation? Even they were confronted with temptation to sin. It's not those who have discovered the secret to escape temptation to whom Jesus says, pray, lead us not into it. It's those who know the great danger in which we live and also know how weak and helpless we are to identify sin, let alone stand against it. It's in those who are followers of Jesus, those who are the lambs of his flock, that Jesus directs to pray, lead us not into temptation. Lead us. That's important to remember. Those two words should really sink in only those who are following the master, believers, only the sheep of God's, of the, of the good shepherd pray that God would lead us. We can't lead ourselves. We need to be taken by the hand. The shepherd needs to go in front of us to direct our way through that precarious path. Isn't that just what God the Father sent his son to do? Immediately after Jesus was baptized, it says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted. So much for the theory that faithful people aren't tempted. Even Jesus was tempted. 
God the Father sent God the Son into the world to be led by the Holy Spirit into that wilderness, into that temptation which surrounds all of us. With his divine sight, of course, Jesus does see every temptation clearly. By his almighty power, he failed to succumb to any of it. How could it be anything but good, right, and salutary that we should learn to pray this petition from the only one who has faced every temptation just like us, but withstood them all? Scripture says we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. To pray our Father would not lead us into temptation is not to pray for the power to find our course safely through the minefield that's been set before us. It's to pray that Jesus, who's already walked the minefield, would lead us through it, teaching us where to step. Because we are surrounded by the devil, the world, and our sinful self. And there's no other way to escape it except through Jesus' death and his resurrection. By his cross, he conquered the devil, he overcame the world, and our own sinful self. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who brings us to our Father as people who are grateful for the grace and the desire to resist temptations to sin so that we can be something that glorifies him. Jesus has turned it all upside down so completely that now every temptation to sin can be something that draws you closer to him. Now, when you're tempted, we know we can pray to a God has already, who has already forgiven us. The more we're tempted, the more we pray. The more we are tempted, the more we flee to Jesus. The more we remember these words, lead us not into temptation. I pray that would be true for all of us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We go to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all the faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all you have done for us. Enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> Lord, save and defend your church. 
purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through your holy word and your holy sacraments. Make them perfect in love and in all your good and in all good works, and establish them in faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By your word and your Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in any need of sickness or adversity. For Joe, for Dale and Nancy, for Jerry, Irvin, Terry, Pat, Ruth, Jim, for Larry, Travis, Ryan, John, for Norma, for Betty, for Georgie, for all those that we name in our hearts and in our minds. Bring consolation to them and grant to them a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Then finally, all these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as our offering is gathered. We'll sing verse 1 and 2 of hymn 781. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for those who have given and for those who do receive these gifts. We pray they would be a blessing to them, and that in all things these would be used for your purpose and the extending of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we do pray that. Amen. We're going to turn to page 208 in our hymnals. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. You are holy and merciful, Lord God, for you have manifested to us your own Son to be our Savior and Redeemer. He has accomplished our salvation by his suffering in the flesh and the blood he shed upon the cross. As he has fulfilled his promise and accomplished all things by his death and resurrection, so now keep us in him until the day of his coming, when with angels and archangels, with cherubim and seraphim, with the whole host of heaven, rejoice to stand before you, joining, evermore praising you and singing. Or not. Disconnect. Lovely. <laughs> um, we can probably sing this, right? Holy, holy, O oh Lord, Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth with full Successful connection. Shout the glories of your name. Sing Hosanna in the highest. Sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy, mighty, holy, and merciful God, from the beginning you held forth the hope of redemption that the people lost to you because of sin might be returned to you by the means of the Savior long promised. Now having fulfilled all things for our salvation by the offering of his flesh for the life of the world and his blood atoned for our sin, grant us your Holy Spirit that we whom he has bidden may come in confidence to receive all that he has promised 
Now by his own bidding, we come in his name to his supper, that we may be strengthened in body and soul upon the food of his flesh, as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Um, I apologize. I'm trying to get there.
Now may this eating and this drinking of our Savior's precious body and his blood, may it strengthen you, preserve you, keep you in that one true Christian faith that does lead you to eternal life. Then know in peace and know in joy your sins are forgiven you. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Of your goodness, O Lord, you have bestowed upon us the bread that nourishes our bodies, the bread of life that nurtures us to life everlasting. Grant that what you have begun in us, you may also bring to fulfillment on that day when distance shall no longer divide us and we shall be one people in your presence forevermore. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And then with believing hearts, receive the blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. We're going to sing verse 1 and then 4 and 5 of hymn 744. Good morning. So, just a couple things. Um, be on the lookout. All the youth stuff wheels are, are, are in the process of getting to turn. I hope to get most everything kind of uh, nailed down and in place uh, by the end of this week. So, start next Sunday, we'll know when everything's going to be running. So, just be on the lookout for that. Um, I want to thank everybody who helped out with uh, VBS. Um, we just we ran into a few conflicts with uh, other things that were going on. So I think the formal count was we had one more volunteer than we had kids, but <laughs> something like that. We had like 16 or 17 kids, though we had a great time, and so many people stepped up. Some of the youth were here to help out, and it was just it was it was a blast. I love doing those things. Um, it was exciting. We got to talk about baptism with some kids who uh, weren't baptized and. And some kids who haven't been part of a church since they were baptized and why it's important and that generate a lot of really good conversations and that's that's the real reason I do VBS is to try to connect those families to our uh, our church um, some of those families are coming to family fun night which is tonight tonight's the last one of the year it starts at five o'clock just right next door in our our backyard and we invite all of you to come on over some stick around for a little while and eat a, eat a brat or a burger or what else we have? In, is there some pulled pork even? Yeah, there's, there's more good food than you should be allowed to have. That's just what there is. Um, it's just tasty. But, uh, but come to that, you get to meet those folks. They get to meet you. They find out that those people who move their cars on Sunday by that one building 
don't aren't just necessarily all that weird right um, and we get to meet maybe some folks in the community you don't know yet know we get to reconnect ourselves uh, it's just a, it's just a fun time some folks have been known to stay past midnight that's just awesome as well um, stay as long as you like and uh, and but we just have a lot of a lot of good fun last thing is you know we got a big huge apple tree right and what don't tell them don't tempt them oh with the apple <laughs> very good I love it my family's thinking faster than me today see there you go so we got a bunch of apples um, there are buckets down here the um, as you as you walk out uh, south um, the buckets belong to the church so bring those back but there's a bunch of apples there I guess they're essentially organic no pesticides herbicides or or fertilizers um, we did our best to go through them but just you know recheck them because the worst thing is to find a half and a worm in the apple because yeah you, what happens if you find a half a worm in the apple where's the other half yeah yeah so do do check them but we did our best to make sure there's none of them that are pocked or full of holes or anything fun like that but um, let's see that's what I know for now anything else if not as always I pray God's blessings on your week let's see if I can pray play you some post service music oh look at that God's blessings on your week